right, uh, seven o'clock, we'll go ahead and start the May 17th select board meeting, 7 p.m. Um, first order of business is to approve the agenda or are there any changes? I make a motion to approve the agenda as written. Okay, is there a second? Second. Or, sorry, Katie. All right, it's been moved and seconded. I waited. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, consent agenda items, minutes of the May 3rd meeting and the outside consumption permit for Smuggler's Notch Distillery. Anyone wanna make a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda as written. Okay. Is there a second? Somebody, I think somebody seconded, I missed it. Okay, Danny seconded. All right, um, any further discussion? All those in favor? Please say aye. 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 All right. Public portion of the meeting. We're a couple minutes early, but this is an opportunity uh, and not your only opportunity to speak as the public on anything that's not on the agenda. Um, you are allowed to speak on items while we're going through the agenda as well. So don't feel like this is the only opportunity to speak. But uh, if anyone from the public would like to speak um, on a topic that's not on the items below um, feel free to go ahead at this time you can either raise your hand digitally or uh, I don't know if, I know we we're talking about the chat feature I'm not sure if they can still post in the chat but feel free to go ahead all right um, I think we can go ahead and then start select board business or do we need to wait till 708? Um, I think you can, I think you can go ahead if you like. All right. Um, I know somebody, some, some of you just joined. If uh, you had anything to say during the public portion, feel free to just jump in now or we're gonna move ahead towards the select board business. Okay, uh, we're gonna move on to select board business. Uh, item A, consider request for entertainment permit. Yeah, um, that's, that's me. And we don't actually have a request right now. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to get a hold of Tom Murphy, let me just show something to you. So um, there was a Blair Barn front porch forum <clears throat> last week. Tom Murphy is a, 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 a acrobatic comic, uh, a lot of circus training. Uh, he lives in Watery Center uh, up on uh, Spruce Haven, I think. But he's got a he's got a barn uh, on Maple Street, right? near um, Dacra, uh, Hope Davy Field. And I happened to be going through Front Porch Forum the other day and I noticed that he has this event which is um, limited, uh, limited number of people. I think he's limiting it to 80 people. And this event, which is gonna happen outside uh, on his property is clearly something that the entertainment permit contemplates issuing a permit for. And uh, as I said, I've not been able to get in touch with Tom yet. So he has not filled out an application, but um, I guess from my perspective, if the board is inclined to do so, um, we can look at this. He's got five to eight o'clock uh, and this is what he has for a schedule of the, uh, you, you can't see any of this, can you? I didn't share my screen. Let me, I'm sorry, let me share the screen here. Uh, somebody should have interrupted me. Uh, let's see here, sorry about that. Okay, share screen, now this is what I wanna do. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Can you enable it? You're on mute, Carla. I think you should be all set. 
Okay. Okay, so Tom Murphy, that's this guy here, in the red shirt. Um, Audville, he tours in Europe. He's got, uh, this is a very professional um, show that they put on. Five to eight o'clock on Saturday, June 5th at 76 Maple Street, which is um, two doors to the right of the parking lot on Maple Street at Waterman Center, Hope Davies Park. This is what the schedule of events are. So five to eight, it does not go late into the night. Um, outdoor show at six o'clock. Uh, you know, it, it's going to go until about 7.15 and then you're going to have some, um, evidently a, a small friendly dance band for about 40 minutes. Um, the town has a authorized this event for Tom in the past. Um, it's never been a problem. So I guess if the board would consider it just to be kind to him, uh, I mean, I'm sure he just has forgotten that he's supposed to have a, a permit. But um, if the board would consider issuing a permit for those hours and for that event, and then let me track him down, I'll be willing to do that. Any comments from the board? Um, I guess my question is, is, is the barn permitted for events and any kind of zoning permit? I don't know. I just didn't know if there was a scenario that if it was like every time events happen at the Grange, they don't need to apply for a permit, right? But that's because of their what they're zoned as. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure, Mike. I don't know that for certain. I think he's doing it outside. Yes, he is doing it outside. I just said that. Not in the barn. It's at the barn, though. Um, I don't see why I, I don't have a problem with it. I guess the question is, is in a typical scenario, if you were to apply for this permit, it would go to the board and give the public comment and give up, but he wouldn't have to alert neighbors or anything. So, I mean, it seems like it would be just your standard permit. Right. And, you know, the, the board doesn't meet next until June 7th. So, you know, this is one of those odd months. There's five Mondays in May. If it was uh, any other month, there'd be one more meeting, but you don't meet until the 7th of June and that's two days after this event. So um, I'm just trying to, you know, be consistent that we allow the, um, I didn't put on the agenda where we were considering the entertainment permit for, I suppose I should have done that. But um, anyway, that's, all I have to say about it. Mark? But so you're concerned about whether or not it's the type of event that he's holding is allowed in that area? Is that what your consideration is? Concern is? Who are you asking? You, Mark Fryer. No, I was just trying to understand if his barn was already zoned for events and then why you would have to do an individual permit. But I understand that maybe it's not in the barn, it's in the yard. And then I think it's just the standard event permit. So. I guess the just unique thing here is that we're basically potentially approving it without it having the permit, but I understand the timing problem and I don't, I don't have a problem with it. Well, I mean, I would still, I would still make him apply and I would still make him, you know, pay the fee. It's just that we're doing it a little bit in reverse. Um, again, uh, if people are interested in what, what he's talking about doing, it's, it's really this outdoor live show, uh, which is these people doing, you know, vaudeville, slapstick, uh, acrobatic routines, and then uh, a little bit of music uh, and dancing on the lawn until eight o'clock. So it won't even be dark by the time they're done. <laughs> and you said he's done this before and there haven't been any issues or complaints or anything, correct? Yeah, he's done it at the barn at least once before, Danny, and uh, a number of years ago, he actually 
rented the uh, Hope Davy Field and he had a big tent and he did a huge show there that the town allowed, you know, we, we rented him the facility and he did a much bigger event than this. And uh, I think he did it over, might have been, I know it was at least two shows, it may have been three and there's never been any issue. And um, I think he's limiting the seating in this event to uh, 80 people. It doesn't say that here, I don't believe, but I think I read that on front porch form, so. Yeah, I saw that on the event page, that 80 is the cap. I can make a motion if you'd like. Sure. Okay, I move to approve. The event permit for Tom Murphy and company on June 5th, in the hours between five and eight. Okay. Bill, do you need any anything else in the motion? Uh, no, I think that's I think that's good enough. Um, you know, I just think Carla, when you in Chris's motion, just put the event as described on his advertisement page. Okay. I didn't leave that out. I wasn't going to put that in there. But... Um, is there a second? Again. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, uh, Blush Hill Boat Access, Mike Bard, and there was an email today with a map if everyone has that. Yeah, I'll put that up. So, sorry, Mike, I know you, uh, you emailed me last week, but I'll let you take it away and then I'll, uh, I'll comment. I don't know what you were planning to say. I know you just asked for this to be on the agenda. Well, your email did clarify things and it made it, what I was gonna say is probably changed a little bit because the way the ordinance is written, it kind of doesn't, because what the problem is, is we had a non, a no parking ordinance from one side of Blush Hill Road down toward the boat access. That is in place. But in addition to the boat access, there's, you know the road down toward the by the actual like parking area and whatnot there is a no parking area that's very designated between the signs there's no parking you know because of, of you know boats with trailers i have frequently seen cars without trailers parked in in, the, in that space and i got it wasn't because i i was not even there with the boat I got so frustrated because I know one time the state police said, well, you, sh you, you, sh you should call. So I did call the, the state police and about 45 minutes after I called, the state trooper did come and said he would, he would take a look because I had to go up toward uh, Michigan Avenue to get some uh, cell service. Uh, when I got there, I walked down and spoke to him and he said, basically he has, no jurisdiction, you know, there. And I and I guess one of the big problems is on the sign, it just says no parking. It doesn't say like a subsection of violators will be ticketed or towed. But after seeing what Bill sent out, it really doesn't cover that parking area, what, what we had as, as an ordinance. And maybe it should. Well, here's the deal. So this, this is the road here. Right. This is the road. And the yellow lines are the edge of the town's highway right of way. The green on this side and the green on this side is the state, is the state land. Um, and our ordinance, I don't have the language up, but I sent it to you all, indicates from Michigan Ave, down the left side of the road, down to right to where you are now. Mile, and it's to the, the turnaround. It's to the entrance to the turnaround. So basically, on the left side of the road here, this is this is where we 
uh, regulating no parking. And the no parking ordinance that the town has can be enforced by the state police. It can be enforced by um, the county sheriff or whomever. Uh, it has worked pretty well. This, this yellow line here, that's a horizontal line basically, <coughs> excuse me. That's the end of the town highway right of way. This area is the cul-de-sac, the turnaround, and you can see some cars and trailers are parked there in that picture. That land is owned by the state. We don't have the right to have an ordinance that says people can't park here. The signs that Mike is talking about, it says no parking, you know, boat trailers or whatever, are on the right-hand side of this cul-de-sac. And those signs were put up by the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. We put up the signs along the road. We can enforce that. But <clears throat> when, you know, this road before, before the mid 1930s, when the dam was built, this road went right across and it went over to Greg Hill. And uh, when the dam was built, the town discontinued the road from this point on and the land reverted to the, the former landowners. And by that time, the state had basically bought all the land around the park. So um, we cannot regulate what happens in that cul-de-sac. And that's why, that's why I kind of said, and I, I did see Chad was on the, um, on the Zoom. I would like to hear his perspective because I know there are a lot of voters that really are not very happy because we see all the time in that no parking area, a, just a total disdain for just parking there because they don't want to, you know, fall their kayak or their canoe or whatever you know, another 100, 200 feet. You know, they want, they see a close parking space and they totally ignore that, uh, you know, you know, space. Right, and, and the other thing too, Mike, and you probably know this maybe better than I do even, but this is not a designated fishing access by the Vermont uh, Fish and Wildlife Department. And if it were a fish and wildlife um, place, then you know the right of way basically goes to those who are who are fishermen, and you're not supposed to go in there just to launch pleasure boats or kayaks. People do, but you have to give preference to fishermen. But this is not a, a fish and wildlife uh, designated access area for the. For the reservoir, the the official access for that is over at the dam, I think, um, and maybe at Waterbury Center as well. But um, I don't know if Chad's on or not. But um, Chad's here. But I saw on the uh, chat he says no audio or video video capability. Sorry. So you can't. You know, again, I agree with everything you said, Bill. I know inside out all the fish and wildlife, but that whole area was improved by, I believe, Fish and Wildlife. Uh, and it, was, it was improved by Green Mountain Power. Green Mountain Power. Uh, Green Mountain Power, when they got their new um, FERC license to operate the, the power dam over there, uh, one of the things that they had to do was to improve the boat accesses in order to help improve water quality and they improved the one at the dam and at Lush Hill, both dramatically. They put in new, you know, concrete pads, uh, you know, new pavement. Uh, and their goal, for what they were doing, was, I think, to make it easier for boaters to get in and out, but also to turn up the water far less than they used to when it was, especially at Lush Hill, when it was just the basically a you know gravel access down to the water and uh, it, it just got all silted up all the time. So uh, it was not a fish and wildlife project. I'm sure that they were happy that it was done because it yeah. clean water it's just the fish. But, but, but 
you know, your, your, your issue though, Mike, it brings up the secondary point. And this is what I talked about uh, last year when we adopted this ordinance. Having an ordinance that restricts where people park is a good thing. And most, I mean, it improved dramatically up there after we put those signs up. Uh, people were parking all over the place early in the year last year. Uh, it was the first spring of COVID. People didn't have anything else to do. They couldn't go anywhere. So a lot of people were using the, the reservoir and a lot of people were using that access, especially at this time of year because the Waterway Center State Park isn't open yet. So you can't get on the water from the state park there. I, I haven't been up much this year to see how much it mirrors last year. But once we put the signs up, most people did refrain from parking on the left side and they were able to, you know, the folks that lived there were much, much happier about it. But uh, we still don't really do anything to enforce these regulations at all. It's just signage. And the, the state park folks, I think, were out there last year. I went a couple times and, and left notes on people's windshields telling them that this was important and please pay attention to the rules. Uh, but I don't have the authority to write a ticket. I have too. I've, I have sent little nasty Graham saying, you know, you're in a no parking zone, but <laughs> it doesn't seem to go very far. And you gave me the answer when you said, I didn't, I didn't know if we were in control of that cul-de-sac and okay. def definitely it appears it's, it's not. So I don't know if it's an issue, you know, maybe it's something, you know, we should appeal to, uh, you know, either Green Mountain Power or, uh, you know, you know, Fish and Wildlife to see if, they, if, if there can uh, be some enforcement activity. Maybe it's Forest Parks and Recreation. Green Mountain Power just did the improvements or paid for the improvements there, but it's, it's, uh, Parks and Recreation land, I believe. So, right. and the improvements are great. You know, it's it's a great. And again, since COVID, there's a, a lot more use, but that's also that's what's created the problem because a lot more people are using it, and people are parked way up to Michigan Avenue because there's some parking. You know, it'd be nice to see if there was some additional parking that might have been put up there by, you know, either Green Mountain Power or uh, Forest Parks and Recreation. Yeah. Well, like you said, Chad's listening. So I think you can do, after seeing you, your detail from, uh, you know, it does, you know, any enforcement is really not in our value. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks. Anything else on that or we'll move on? Nope. All right. Uh, consider zoning enforcement settlement agreement potential executive session. Yeah, I would recommend that you go into executive session for this. I sent out the motions that need to be made. And for those who are listening, uh, Carla thinks she has the ability to put you into a, into a uh, private waiting room. This shouldn't take too, too long. Um, if the board does go into executive session and Carla can't get that to happen, she'll just boot you off and then you can sign back in and she'll keep you in a waiting room until the uh, executive session is over. Um, somebody want to read the motions? We start with that first one, Bill, that you emailed. Yep. I move to find that premature general public knowledge of the town's litigation strategy in the town of Waterbury versus Darren Thibault case currently pending in the Vermont Superior Court Environmental Division would clearly place the select board, which has control over such litigation for the town at a substantial disadvantage. In light of this finding, I move. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, sorry, we got to find it first. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. <laughs> um, is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 In light of this finding, I move to enter executive session to include the municipal manager and zoning administrator to consider pending litigation to which the town is a party. Can you include me too so I can let people back in at the appropriate time? And town clerk. 
Okay. Is there a second? Okay. Very good, Katie. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We are going to enter executive session for those. Looks like everyone is back in. Um, Chris, would you like to make the motion? I'll move to approve a settlement agreement as proposed to satisfy a notice of violation for a zoning issue between the town of Waterbury and Aaron Tebu, Waterbury. Second. All right, it's been made and seconded. Any further discussion on the motion? I'll authorize the man we, and yeah I'm worried about that also I'd like to add that do we need to add that bill will execute thanks Mike um who seconded that 80 Katie are you okay with the change yep. okay all right it's been made and seconded any further discussion all those in favor please say aye Hi. Hi. On behalf of the town, we want to thank Dina for uh, all the work that she's done for us. She'll be leaving us in June. Um, and if she's not going to be in the next meeting, this is our opportunity to say thank you. So thank you and good luck with retirement. Congratulations. I'm, I'm envious, Dina. I hope you enjoy your retirement to the fullest extent. Thank you. All right. Um, moving on the agenda to manager's items, consider contract with Potter's Tree Healthcare for removal of roadside ash and trees. Bill, you're muted. We have a grant from the state that we, uh, that Steve presented and, and talked to us about during the budget time. It's a $13,000 project, a $6,500 grant from the state of Vermont, and a $6,500 match from the town. Uh, the project includes um, basically uh, tree and shrub planting in Hope Cemetery over here uh, between Main Street and Warniski Street. That'll be about $6,500 worth of the project will happen in the tree planting phase, uh, which will be at the cemetery. And then the other $6,500 is to um, implement the first phase of the, um, of the uh, ash, roadside ash removal project. If you remember a year ago, we, we funded a, um, uh, an inventory to be done of street trees that the Regional Planning Commission helped us with to identify uh, ash trees in the municipal right of way to determine what their health is and to determine uh, you know, what, what plans should be put in place to help manage the emerald ash borer beetle. So um, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, we sent out uh, request for proposals to four arborists, and we received a bid from two of them. Um, so this is the scope of work that we asked for, and we sent out to the four arborists. There were 15 trees in all, mostly on Gray Hill and Maggie's Way and some on Shaw Mansion Road. Um, and these 15 trees are all going to be uh, removed um, and the, the wood from these trees uh, any below whatever four inch limb wood I guess that gets uh, cut off and shipped. The remaining portion of this wood will be moved down to the uh, storage material area at the ice center and then will be bucked up by the Rotary Club as a public service uh, event to um, you know, use for, for firewood for people who, uh, who need firewood. Um, so we got two, two proposals. 
Uh, you can see this one from Eric Potter. Um, he proposed uh, $4,570 to take down those 15 trees. Uh, Michael Roche with Vermont Arborists, he proposed $7,087. So our recommendation is to take the price from Eric. Now, understand this is a, um, it's a matching project. So in order to get the $6,500 grant, we have to spend $6,500. So when Steve Latspeech put together this list, he had had conversations with Dan Sweet and other people who know about, you know, uh, tree removal and the like. So we started with this list of 15 trees and thought that that would come up close to the 6,500. Eric has given us a very good price. So we've already talked to Eric and we'll be probably adding um, four to six additional trees to this to get his uh, price up to 6,500 because we've got to spend $6,500 in order to get the $6,500 tree planting grant. So there'll be a few more trees that are added to this, uh, to this list. So with that explanation, I'll answer questions if you have them, um, but staff's recommendation is to award the contract to Eric Potter. He's got all the necessary insurance and uh, we'll just negotiate with him to get enough trees to get it up to $6,500. Any questions? Bill, I mean, I don't know if you can answer this question, but are these already diseased trees or are they just Taking yeah. them out. Yeah, these, these are trees that are already showing some signs of weakness. They're not necessarily diseased. I don't think we have confirmation yet, Chris, that there's ash borer beetle that's been found in Waterbury. I mean, it's likely here. I know there's been a case in Moortown, uh, and uh, Montpelier has had several. So I wouldn't be surprised, but so far in our inventory, to the best of my knowledge, we have not found any trees yet that have the beetles in it. But as is with all uh, life forms, the the weaker uh, the weaker specimens are more susceptible. So there's you know ash trees have uh, they're susceptible to a lot of different um, um, blights, if you will, uh, both insecticidal and and uh, and uh, you know more. I don't know what. I'm not a biologist, but you know from insects and from fungus and other things like that. Moles, they're susceptible. Uh, and and some of these trees, when they start start to show some stress in the crown, those are the places the beetle probably would go first. So the idea is to remove the uh, the weak trees from this from our roadsides hoping to keep the beetles at bay longer. Um, do we need to make a motion of spending up to $6,500 or how do you want to do that? Yeah, you need to make a motion to, uh, to authorize the, uh, to approve the selection of Potter for this, uh, for this job and to, uh, to authorize up to the $6,500 to be spent. All right, anyone want to make the motion? Unless there are more questions. Okay. I, have a, I have a question. Would the homeowners have the first right if they wanted the firewood? Or, because again, they're probably going to have, I don't know, it could be good or bad, whether it be property improvement or you know, some detrimental thing, you know, some people are going to say, well, that tree might be good for so long, you know, it's part of my view, you know, but I, I think that the homeowner should give, be given first rights to the potential firewood at whatever sale price they're going to charge. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know that for certain, Mike, but I believe that's the case and th there won't be any charge for, for them, but uh, I, I don't know that for certain, but my recollection is yes, the homeowners would first be offered to, you know, have the have the wood if they wanted it. Okay, thanks. 
Great. Any other questions? Take a motion. To authorize the hiring of Eric Potter for the tree removal project, um, spending up to $6,500. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Katie. Um, all right, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Danny, there's something going on with your microphone. I'm not sure what's going on, but I'm having a little trouble hearing you. I'm not sure if anyone else is. All right, uh, hold on, I gotta bring up my agenda. All right, next on the agenda, VSP resident trooper reports that were sent out, I think, by Carla with the agenda. Yep. They're also located on our website under public safety if anyone else is interested. I don't really have any report to make on it. It was fairly self-explanatory. If you have questions, um, you know, I'll, I don't have it right here in front of me. I, I thought I put it up, but I, I, I guess I closed it out. Um, so I don't have anything specific to add. It's a fairly self-explanatory report. They're still working under kind of COVID protocols through March. That was the, the March report. Mark uh, Matea, former select board member, uh, former state trooper, uh, still helps compile those uh, reports that we get from Lieutenant White and he puts it into, uh, puts it into this form. And this is Mark kind of running the show right now. And um, So they had 73 calls in March, which is kind of about normal, that things that they respond to. Um, I think this is important to show that, you know, we're not just covered by the trooper contract, we're also covered by Vermont State Police when those troopers aren't on or if there are multiple calls. Right. Yeah, Danny, I'm not sure that you know, maybe we talked about this early in the, uh, when you first came on, but Waterbury's contract is for 80 hours a week. We have two specific schedules, day shift and one night shift. Uh, but, you know, the, uh, it does not cover 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. And uh, when the troopers are not working or if they're, sick or whatever the, the other troops in the area uh, obviously respond. But uh, we get much quicker response time, of course, when the troopers are right here in town. Mark, was the, uh, is there still, uh, They still talk about uh, the COVID protocol as far as traffic tickets. I don't remember seeing that, but I could be wrong. That was gonna be one of my questions because I saw that there was a, down, a decline in, I think, stops. And I think it was somewhere in there writing that they were trying to go back on those uh, because of COVID. So I was wondering if they were gonna start um, with the with going back and doing the traffic stops. Yeah, so it's been a long time since uh, anybody has come here to actually visit with us. And it's difficult to get the troopers to be able to uh, attend a select board meeting by, by Zoom. Uh, you know, they're, one of them is usually on duty uh, and it's, difficult to do that. I'm hopeful, uh, as I talked to you last time, um, 
when we have our meetings in June, your next meeting is on June 7th, um, we will be back in person at that time. And I'm sure it's not going to be June 7th, but I'll work with Lieutenant White to try to get um, schedule a time where he and maybe one of the troopers can come in and just kind of reacquaint uh, the board and and the troopers with each other. Here we go. Um, so they they still uh, through March anyway were uh, limiting their responses. So that means that they're really not actively running a lot of radar, and uh, you know they're doing they're doing patrols, but they're not they're not. Uh, using their standard operating procedures and their interactions with the motoring public is far lower now that they're on, you know, with their, these COVID protocols. So since the governor is suggesting that we're moving away from those protocols, I'm hopeful that they will begin to move back toward their more normal operating procedure. But I'll try to work with Lieutenant White to get them to a meeting uh, maybe sometime this summer, July probably. That would be really helpful, Bill. Um, I think I have. I think all the questions that I have are pretty nuanced. That likely you, you know, they would have the answers to. So um, that would be great to to be able to talk with them in person. Yep. Okay. Um, and then, Mark, I don't know if you see Dana, Dana's hand is up. Uh, Dana, go ahead. Yeah, actually, just a quick question about um, location data. I know they can't share location data for like certain types of infractions and things like that, but are they able to or do they share uh, location data for things like traffic violations and um, things like that, just out of curiosity? Um, well, the answer thing is I don't know. They 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 don't typically do that. I'm I'm not suggesting that they can't, uh, and that's something that we can ask about. But uh, you know, typically what we get is aggregate information. They don't tell us that they stopped five people on Walewski Street and four people on Stowe Street or anything like that as a matter of routine. Um, I certainly reach out to Lieutenant White when I get calls or emails from people, um, you know, I know that you've, uh, you've uh, emailed me in the past and a couple of months ago, I think I, I sent back to you this information about the fact that their COVID protocols are limiting their, their in-person uh, interactions. But that's something that we can certainly talk about, Dana, but as a routine, we just, we don't get it. Um, uh, we can ask for it and see what they say. Yeah, that, I think that could be interesting and great if they're able to provide it. Um, so thanks, I appreciate that. All right, any other questions on the VSP resident trooper reports? Okay, we'll move on to item C, discuss equity training. Okay. Um, so after our last meeting, uh, I met with Alexia Venefra, uh, who's here on the on the Zoom meeting tonight, and uh, Maureen McCracken, and we had a, a, I think, a fruitful conversation about uh, what has happened in the past, some of the concerns that have been expressed, uh, both at recent board meetings and past board meetings, and the whole idea about getting some training for the select board and um, you know, maybe the, the management staff. Um, we met for about an hour or so, uh, a week and a half ago. And as I said, I thought it was a fruitful discussion. I told them at that time that on Danny's recommendation, I had reached out to a woman by the name of Mary Gannon to see if, um, if Mary might be able to do something for us. Uh, I'm gonna share something on my screen here. Um, so I availed myself last Thursday uh, with the uh, Vermont Town and City Management Association. I went to their conference, which 
unfortunately was held by Zoom. Uh, we haven't had the ability to have an in-person meeting either. But we did have um, this uh, very, very good session uh, for leading equitable communities. And this Aaliyah Wilson is, uh, as you can see there, she works for the city of Norfolk, Virginia. And she had a very good presentation that was made to uh, myself and my colleagues, other managers from cities and towns in Vermont. And, uh, you know, had some very interesting things to say. Uh, I do have, I, I don't have the ability to, to send it out right now. I'll see if I can, but there was a, a slide presentation that went along with her uh, verbal presentation that was pretty interesting. And there was some um, interesting informational materials that she shared. So I did uh, have that training last um, Thursday myself. And um, I spoke with Mary Gannon um, about a week plus ago now. I think it was Friday a week ago that I spoke with Mary the first time. And then I talked with her on uh, Tuesday last week. We talked for about 45 minutes to an hour possibly. And just, you know, kind of getting to know each other a little bit. Uh, what the concerns were from the community and what I thought the board was looking for. Now, Mary, just as an aside, she's an independent consultant and an educator. So um, I thought she worked with the Vermont Partnership for Fairness and Diversity, which is in Brattleboro, from what I understand. Uh, she's very familiar with that organization and has worked with them, but she does not, she's not an employee of theirs and is not directly affiliated with her. She shared with me some work that she has done with the town of Brattleboro and the town of Putney. Uh, she's also done a lot of work in New Hampshire communities. And uh, it was, it was uh, a good conversation that we had. So I asked her to uh, call me back. We ran out of time that first day. And uh, I asked her for some references. So we spoke um, on Friday morning, just the other day, I mean, on Thursday morning uh, last week. And we, we kind of have been narrowing things down here, narrowing the focus. And uh, I was hoping that she was gonna be able to have a proposal that I could share with you for tonight. But when I talked with her on Thursday last week, she said that she was uh, quite busy. She had commitments um, both on Friday and early this week. So she asked me if she could make a written proposal to share with me that she would get to me at the end of this week. <coughs> Excuse me. So I told her, of course, that would be fine. Uh, I took some time today and called Peter Elwell, who's the uh, town manager in Brattleboro. I've known Peter for a long time. And in fact, I knew his father long before him. His father was the town manager in Brattleboro when I first started working here in Vermont 40 years ago. So I talked with Peter and he gave me some insight as to what uh, Mary uh, was doing for them. They're, they've put together a program where uh, they are um, having ongoing training and it includes both the board and almost all of the staff. Uh, and at some point we may get to that point. But I, I told Mary, I thought for right now, uh, given what my sense was from the community that the select board and myself and, you know, potentially Carla, uh, maybe other, other folks in uh, you know, at management level here might be involved. So anyway, Mary told me that she would get me a proposal uh, late this week. What I told her was that I would share the proposal with the board at your June 7th meeting. We've already penciled in training to happen at your June 21st meeting. Um, and, um, you know, I. I don't have a I don't have a, a 
an agenda yet. I don't have a reading list. I don't have anything. I'm waiting for the proposal that Mary's going to send, which will, which will come this week. But I asked her if we could try to pick a date now. Uh, she threw out a couple of different times, and one of them happened to be June 21st. And I said, well, that's a select board meeting night. If we can have that training on that night, we can keep the agenda very, um, very uh, sparse for other business that night, try to get through that very quickly, and then have a couple of hours for her. Um, we kicked it around a little bit. She, she thinks that probably, at least for this initial training, um, she's thinking about four hours of time. We kicked around, well, should we do it? You know, try to start in the late afternoon, break for, break for uh, something to eat and then come back and do the, the last two hours a little bit later. Um, and in the end, she said, you know, it's, it's a little bit, uh, sometimes it can be a little bit heavy material. There's questions. And she said, I, I think it's better not to overwhelm them all at once. It's probably easier to do in a couple of sessions. So that's what I have to share for now. Um, I, I can't give you specifics as to what she's going to do because I don't have that proposal yet. It will be the board's choice at the June 7th meeting to decide to move forward with this or not. Obviously, there'll be a cost component. I haven't even talked to her about that yet because I, I think that is far from the top of the uh, issues of importance. Uh, you know, I think we'll be able to find whatever money it is. I, I don't think it's going to cost us $50,000 to, to have a couple of hours of training. So um, I'm not too concerned at this point about finding the money for it, but um, I think that's what I can tell you for now. And um, I will likely share that information um, before, the, uh, before the meeting on the 7th. Now, I know there's people here from the media, and I see Alexis still here. One of the things that I asked Mary, and then I followed up with Peter, and I'm going to end up having to call our own legal counsel on this. Um, the, the town of Brattleboro has conducted this training privately. It's something that the board does with, with the facilitator. Uh, Mary, sometimes she works with a, with another woman. I didn't write her last name down. Her first name is Dottie, I know that. But anyway, this is this training, even though it will happen at a select board meeting, uh, my expectation is that the select board will be able to go into whether it's called executive session or private session. When I talked to Peter, he told me that they have a clear opinion from their town attorney that that for the purposes of training, uh, the select board can meet with these people and do it in, in private. Uh, Mary's preference is to do it in private session. She said it's not helpful. This is not uh, something that's meant to put people on the spot or make examples of people. We're trying to you know, move people from where they are and who they are and get them to understand how they're um, upbringing, how their history, uh, how society around them um, into interplays with their own personalities. And, you know, basically we are who we and society have made us to be. And she said it's, it's not helpful to have this done in a fashion that people could be, um, you know, humiliated. So the expectation is that on the 21st of June, if we go ahead with this, that it will be a, a short select board meeting where you'll do a little bit of business and then you'll move into a, this training session privately. And I just want to be upfront with the public right now. That's that's our my goal. Uh, the select board, if they choose and you say, well, we want to do this in public, that's your choice. But uh, I think based on my conversation with Mary and with Peter from Brattleboro that uh, it's, it would be better to do it privately. So with that, I'll stop talking.
All right, I'm gonna go to the board first, and then Alexia, I see your hands up. I'll go to you after. Um, board, any comments or questions before I go to the public? Yeah, um, I I like the idea of two separate um, sessions of two hours, and um, I like that you reached out to Brattleboro and got what they were doing. Sorry, my significant other is being loud in the background. Um, and um, I'm in favor of this, and she sounds like she knows what she's doing. And um, thank you, Bill, for looking into this and getting this information. Yeah, Bill, I really appreciate the time you put into it. And um, I don't need to elaborate because I agree with what Katie just said. I think two sessions would, would be really helpful for digestion and, and um, you know, learning and intensity. I too think it's great that uh, this is finally happening. Uh, the other thing is, I agree with Katie, the two two hour sessions seem to be much better because again, some people's attention spans, you know, waver after, you know, if you go four hours straight through, that might be a tough, tougher intake. Yeah, I, and I agree with that. And I also think that, it, um, and this may be stating the obvious, but you know, this is not this training is not intended to be like flipping a light switch that everybody is going to, you know, starts here and then after this, they're going to be here. This is a this is a a process. It's like any real learning. It's it's kind of a lifelong thing, and uh, you know, people will find that. We're all on various points of, of the spectrum and not always in the same place at the same time. There's some things that probably, you know, we're all very much in the right place on. And then there's other things that some people are on one end and other people are on the other. And, and it's meant to be informative and it's meant to be uh, transformational that, you know, this is something that will be practiced on an ongoing basis. And, uh, you know, I'm not here to say we're gonna have to have a session every single uh, week, but the woman that um, talked to the Vermont Town and City Management Association on Thursday talked about the fact that um, at every meeting, she tries to have some, um, some tidbit, some thing on each agenda that can get people thinking about this kind of issue. And I, you know, I, I don't have any examples that come to mind right now that that she talked about, but it was, it was um, something that they were um, intentional about. That you know, they they had something every meeting, even if it was just a ten minute discussion about something, to help kind of continue to move people through on the continuum. So anyway, um, I'll get more information to you by the 7th. On the 7th, you'll have to talk about it and decide for certain that you're going to do it and authorize the, the money to be spent. But it is tentatively scheduled for the 21st right now. Uh, Alexia, or yeah, Alexia, go ahead. Hello. Hey, um, first of all, I actually, I just, I want to say, I appreciate everything that you just said in when you first were talking. And then again, I, I completely agree um, that this is a process and um, I'm speaking as an individual, uh, as an individual constituent um, currently. And um, I agree that, um, that it should be private and out of the public eye. I think that for any, for any kind of work, deep work it requires vulnerability and that is really difficult to do when you're when you feel like you're under scrutiny so i want i just wanted to voice um support for that and i think i, I agree i think it's a huge necessity um, and i just want to thank you all so much for being willing to do the work thank you all right any other comments from the board or the public on this, um, Bill, we don't need to make a motion. I'm assuming because we haven't don't have the plan yet, but we'll vote on the June meeting on the training once we get the basically the proposal. Yeah, there's nothing to vote on now, Mark. You're right. 
All right. I, uh, yeah, I also agree. I think it's a great step forward and I'm glad to hear that things are in motion. So thanks, Phil, and thanks everyone for being patient on this. Um, moving on to manager item E, staffing update. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, D, board orientation issues. Okay. Well, you could have you could have skipped right over that, Mark, because I really don't have anything right now. Um, Carl and I put this agenda together last week, and I thought I was going to be able to do something. Um, so my hope going forward, and it's much easier to do this kind of orientation stuff for me anyway in in person. And um, I know we had a little bit of a glitch when Danny first started in terms of uh, you know voting and what what saying something means what doesn't what not saying something means and the like so my intent is to um over the next several meetings to just every once in a while bring something to the board maybe that um you know some of you a long time folks on the board will think oh this is boring why do we have to talk about this again uh but you know danny is brand new uh, Katie is still pretty new, and, and Katie didn't really have any opportunity to, uh, I think you had, what, two meetings in person, maybe, three? Um, and, uh, you know, then COVID started. So uh, if there's anything in particular that any board member would like to know a little bit more about, uh, you can certainly let me know. Um, a number of years ago, before the flood, so it's a long time ago now, I had three new board members all at the same time, and we did a pretty extensive um, orientation. And I'd like to do that again. Unfortunately, all of my, uh, I'm a paper person. I'm not as much anymore. I'm, I'm using the computer to file a lot more electronically now, but all of the orientation materials that I had, I stored in the drawer of my desk, right where I store all my stuff now, and they got flooded. So I don't have that material available right now, but I'll be bringing some of these things to the board uh, and maybe every other meeting or so, we'll just take 20 minutes or so to review something. And if you have questions, we can go from there. So that's a to be announced thing. Mike, go ahead. Yep, just if, if anyone is not on Vermont League of Cities and Towns, if you're not on their email, uh, list. They have a lot of good free meet uh, free meetings that are excellent for select board people. Some are uh, free, some some are paid. But even the paid ones, if there's something that interests you, I'm sure you know you know Bill will be supportive of uh, any of us attending any of those training meetings. Absolutely. Carla, were you, was your hand up or was that a way of? Yeah, I was just going to say you all should be on the VLCT distribution list because I provided them their information. So you should be getting emails from them. If you're not, let me know. Okay. Uh, uh, any other questions or comments on that item? All right. Moving on. Staffing update item E. Yeah, I um, mentioned this to you um, because Dina was still here when you were executive session not to you know do it you didn't take any action but i i did want to just let you all know officially that uh dina bookmeyer baker is uh retiring her last day will be july 9th um i can't remember exactly i think she around 2017 uh she came to work for us uh as the zoning administrator and uh, dina is not resigning, not going away mad or in a huff. She's just going to retire and enjoy her grandchildren and her husband who retired from the town of Stowe a year or so ago. Uh, so um, uh, we're going to start up the process of, um, you know, beginning to um, find a, a replacement for, for Dina. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more at the next meeting. But Dina's last day, I believe, is going to be July 9th. So she's got another month and a half or so to go. She'll be around. Um, and uh, I think the DRB will end up having a couple of 
in person meetings before she's gone, so they'll be able to see her in person. But uh, that's the staffing update for right now. Okay. Um, speaking of staffing, have we got any bites uh, on the uh, dog dog position? No. And have we heard any more about library? Um, any new hires or interviews for those positions? Um, so, Jill Chase retired. She was the um, the the circulation assistant. I think was her title. Uh, I'll be moved. Um, Michelle. Um, Michelle Willie, Michelle Borger Willie to the to that position and is in the process of recruiting a new children's librarian. Uh, we have just extended an offer to her. Um, her name is Ryle. I can't remember her first name. She comes from uh, she's working in, I think it's Dover right now. Um, and uh, you know she'll be starting here sometime before June 14th. So it'll be in June. So those positions are are filled um, or in the process of you know having somebody move here and, and get ready to start. I think you all know that uh, Almi, uh, the library director, Almi Landauer has also resigned her position from the library. Uh, she has some uh, personal concerns that have caused her to decide to resign. And the library commissioners are in the process of recruiting for a new director. I think that they've got some interviews scheduled for maybe late this week or early next week. So they're they're in the process. Almi's last day is going to be June 2nd, I believe. Um, and the new director, I'm not sure, you know, they've got to get through the hiring process. So all the processes are ongoing, Katie, uh, and that's the update. And just to remind all of you, um, the library is uh, a unique um, department in the town. Uh, the library commissioners are directly elected by the public and <clears throat> the state statutes um, spell out the fact that in towns that have elected library directors, the library directors are responsible for hiring, I mean, library commissioners. Uh, the library commissioners are responsible for hiring the director of the library. So. Um, Almi's position of library director is uh, one of the few positions that I don't I don't have a role in hiring and uh, and you know in other departments like the highway department um, the department head um, I'm ultimately the hiring authority in, in all the departments except for the library so I don't have a role in, in this this process. All right, any questions on staffing updates? All right, uh, moving on to budget report, item F. Yeah, I sent out the, uh, the budget report the other day to all of you. Um, I won't take a whole lot of time. Um, again, I find these things are a lot easier to do in person. As I said in my memo to you, uh, where um, what about 33% um, through the year? This is all through April. Um, we're, we're still in May, so I don't have the May numbers here. Um, and you know, the revenues, uh, our largest revenue, of course, is taxes. We don't collect any of that until August. So um, our revenue collection is way behind the curve when you compare it to the when you compare it to the calendar. We've received about eight percent of our total revenues in the general fund uh, through April. Um, it's a little bit higher in the highway fund. Um, I'll drop down there for a second. 
So with the highway fund, well, it's actually lower. It's only 5% in the highway fund. And again, taxes is the, is the big, uh, the, the, it's far and away our largest revenue, almost probably 88% of all our revenues are property taxes and we don't get them until late in the year. Um, since I'm right here on the highway, I'll just reiterate what I put in the memo to you or put in the email. Uh, we were very conservative with all of our um, revenue estimates from the state because we just did not have any clue uh, where the state was going to be with regard to its budget and how it would be able to uh, handle its general appropriations. Um, so we only budgeted $85,000 for uh, general aid to highways. Typically, we would budget about $114,000. And as you can see, that $57,000 that we've, that we've taken in to date, if that continues through the second two quarters of the year, would be right at that 114 level. So um, on, on at least this one state revenue, it looks like we're going to easily hit budget and go beyond it. Excuse me, this $57,000, the state is on a July 1st calendar year, I mean, a July 1st fiscal year. So these are payments for the state's quarter three and four, which were uh, appropriated in the budget that they put to uh, vote and approved in May of 2020. The first payment we got was in, in uh, July. The second payment we got was in October. Those are 2020 revenues for us. These two payments are based on the budget from a year ago from the state. My expectation is that this will go up a little bit. Um, as I said, the House, um, when they were going through their budget process, they significantly increased aid to highways uh, in their budget. The Senate chose not to do that. The Senate put more money into uh, grant programs. Uh, on a personal level, when I testify at the State House, I, I, I advocate for more general aid to highways because all towns get that general aid to highways and all towns don't necessarily have projects that are ready and uh, able for those grant funds. The grant funds are competitive and you don't always get them when you really need to do your project. So more general aid is preferable to me, but uh, this is a tug of war that always goes on in the state house. And last I heard, it looks like the Senate's probably gonna win and more money will go into those grant programs. Um, so I'll go back to the general fund uh, and go down, whoops. So um, moving into the, and anybody, if you have a question or a comment, you can just interrupt me. But, uh, you know, we're really right on pace in most of the, most of the budgets like general government have employees in it. So all of the staff that works here in the municipal building office are either in the general government budget or they're in the planning zoning budget. And because personnel is such a high uh, percentage of any, any budget, you can see, you know, $349,000 is the payroll budget for the general government and the general government's total budget. You know, it's, it's over a third of the budget. Uh, is just in payroll, uh, in the payroll line alone. And then if you add health insurance and workers' comp and unemployment and those kind of things, it gets up to be, you know, 40% or so of, of a budget. So these budgets that have employees in it are all tracking close to our uh, calendar. Um, the budget, like the fire department, is going to be way behind because, you know, this... I am sending money to the capital fund on a quarterly basis, just to, it's just moving money on paper, but it helps the budget uh, look better in terms of where we are. So we, we send the money at the last, the last day of each, 
the, the last week of each quarter, the, the, the money goes to the capital funds. Um, but the fire budget, as you can see, is lagging behind the calendar. And most of the budgets that don't have personnel or that have personnel that is seasonal, like recreation, they're going to be way behind the calendar. Um, so this is this is pretty typical of this time of year. There's nothing unusual right now that that has happened. Um, the highway budget, as I said, this this is the planning budget, and you can see there that tracks right with the calendar because most of its budget in the planning and zoning department is is personnel. Um, but in the highway fund, uh, the fact that the personnel line is just basically right at or just a little bit above um, where the calendar is, is actually a good sign. Typically through uh, in the winter months, because we're having overtime, um, certainly through the first three months of the year, January, February, and March, which would be 25% of the year, we're usually always in the low 30s by that time. And the fact that we're at 34% right now through 33% of the year is a, is a good sign. It means that they worked less overtime than I budgeted uh, in the highway department. Um, I think you know the library is even more right on pace with the, with the regular pay, basically. The reason they're lagging a little bit is they, they did have some uh, retirements and, and uh, there were some other part-time people who left the employment of the library. So they're going to be a little bit behind the pace and frankly, they may not spend their whole budget because, you know, when Albi retires, it may be several weeks before we get somebody new in. What could happen in the library though, is this health insurance line. Um, the health insurance is chosen by the employees that are on staff in um, in October when they have to sign up for the health insurance for the following year. And I pretty typically budget whatever it is that people choose. So if there are people that choose not to take it, um, that gets factored into the budget. And uh, if they end up resigning their position during the year, and the new person that we hire, if they're eligible and they decide to take it, we're going to be off on the budget. Um, years ago, I used to pad that line a little bit and then found out that for the most part, we have little turnover. And if we do have a, a you know, somebody who goes from zero and then the next person gets a family plan, it's a big hit, but it's usually only for a partial year and it doesn't make sense. So I typically budget what was uh, uh, signed up for in the fall. But those are the three operating budgets. That's where the bulk of the town spending is and all of the revenues uh, come in, all of the tax revenues come into those three departments, uh, those three funds. And then all the rest of what I showed you, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. All these are basically reserve funds. This is the library trust fund. Um, and you know, there's the tax stabilization fund. Um, as I said, if you have questions about that, we really haven't spent much in the CIP budgets yet. Those are funds down here, fund 70. 275 or CIP. So, you know, we have we haven't done any paving yet. <laughs> We've paid interest on, on one of the bonds for paving. Um, we haven't done much on the infrastructure. Um, this is a credit from last year that the accountants will take care of um, for the Main Street project. Um, building improvements. Uh, this is at the highway garage. We did the roof work already. Um, I think it went uh, a little bit over budget. Uh, there's probably going to be some more spending in here that I'll talk to you later about. Um, I don't remember what this unclassified is. I'll have, oh, that's a stormwater project that we received some revenue in the highway department for. So I'll have to move that to the highway fund. But anyway, um, if you have questions about 
especially these funds 14 through 86 or whatever, you can, if you have them not now, I'll try to address them. But uh, if you have questions, you can ask them now. If you don't have questions tonight and want to ask a question, you can call me or email me. So that's all I'll say right now and let you ask any questions that you might have. And otherwise, I'm done. Good, Mike. Uh, Bill, just curious, we're seeing a, several different uh, high level staffing uh, positions change. How do you think that's going to affect the budget? I know it can go either two ways. Sometimes, you know, with a more experienced person, you might actually pay less with someone going into the job at a little lower pay grade, but sometimes you may be more because the demand for those positions and just what they're paying in the competitive market. Where do you think we are with that, Bill? Yeah, it's hard to say. The um, the um, the hirings that we've done in the library to um, you know the part time positions where people resigned, the position where you know Michelle moved up to the to the circulation assistant, and we're hiring a new children's librarian. Uh, the wage rates that we're we're offering in those um, in those jobs are not significantly higher than than they were formerly. Mike, uh, there's a little bit of creep up. I, I've kind of joked with you all in the past that sometimes the only way for public employees to really get a raise is to resign, and then the next person gets gets more money. Um, that's the way it seems to go. Um, we're not far enough down the road yet in the in the search for a new library director. That that's a position where there's a high level of qualifications expected. Um, I'm not sure where that one's going to go, Mike, and I'm not really clued in on that. As I as I told you, I, I don't have a, a real role in hiring uh, the library folks. Um, Dina's uh, retirement was a surprise to me, um, as was Almi's resignation from the library. Almi, as I said, there were personal reasons for her um, that I can't go into. Um, I think Dina has been thinking about it for a while, but she didn't share with me until she made her decision. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. The place, as I said, Mike, where we're the most vulnerable is just on that health insurance loan. We offer health insurance to anybody who works 30 hours a week or more. And, uh, you know, we have some employees who choose not to take the insurance because their spouse or partner has uh, a better insurance plan and they, they take that plan. Uh, and then when they, when they leave, the new person might want our health insurance. So there's there's some exposure there. And uh, you know, we've been hit hard there in the past from time to time. Uh, it's not it's not a huge spike, but it's a pretty big spike, and then it has impacts, you know, going forward year after year. They're they're continuing on their health insurance, but uh, we'll we'll see. Uh, there's certainly um, you know. There's a lot of demand out there for jobs, and this is the you know I know on your parking lot on the uh, on the agenda there's an item that we're going to talk about down the pike a little bit about employee wages, and I've been working on that. And you know I know we had a conversation about wage increases and the like uh, a couple of weeks ago when when I asked about the two percent increase and. What I didn't say then, and I'll, I'll be able to show you, is you know, we have a pretty diverse workforce here. And we have people with advanced professional degrees, um, you know, uh, and they're, you know, there's high demand for, for, for employment for some of the employees who have the credentials that, that we have here. And there's others, of course, at the other end of the spectrum who, who have very uh, labor intensive jobs. Uh, not necessarily, uh, you know, needing high levels of technical education or 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 the like, but 
you know, uh, important jobs for us. So we'll we'll talk about that more. But uh, I know that was a long answer to your short question, Mike. But I hope I answered it. Thanks, Bill. That's really helpful. Any other questions from the board on this? All right. I think. Uh, I one one just preview of the next meeting uh i've been working hard i talked about this during the budget but uh last year in december we issued a a five-year note for one million three hundred and sixty six thousand dollars in change and uh i talked with you during budget time about the possibility of refinancing that it's called refunding the note and um, you know, I had sent you a memo, and I had kind of separated out in that memo some of the things that we bought with that 1.3 million dollars that were relatively short-term expenses. You know, something that we should be willing to pay for in a five-year term, <clears throat> and then other expenses like the fire trucks and and uh, roadside mowers and things like that. That have much longer useful lives. And you directed me to go ahead and try to refund a portion of that note for uh, and turn it into a 15 year bond. So I've been working with the uh, Community National Bank, the bank that authorized the uh, $1.3 million note last uh, December. And I've been working with Paul Giuliani. So at your next meeting on the 7th, I will be bringing a refunding resolution to you, uh, and I'll be asking you to refund uh, $1.1 million uh, and turning that into a 15-year bond. Uh, I think we've got a, a, an excellent rate. Uh, I can't share the rate right now, uh, but I will at the next meeting. Uh, but suffice it to say, our annual payments over the next five years were supposed to be in the range of $290,000 a year. And uh, we'll, with this refunding, uh, we'll drop that to about $140,000 a year. Now, of course, that $140,000, uh, some of it will go out beyond that five-year period. But uh, um, I think it's good news. Uh, the bank was willing to do it, which meant that we didn't have to go through the laborious process of uh, filling out a uh, application to the bond bank and having to spend a lot of money for closing costs with the, through the bond bank process. And we, we will have lawyer fees for this, but we won't have all of the fees that uh, generally um, uh, revolve around uh, going through the bond bank. Typically, the Commercial banks have not been willing to go out more than five years with their municipal paper, but um, you know we're in a whole different environment right now, and I'm happy to say that the Community National Bank was willing to do it. So uh, I'll share that good news more in person at the next meeting. But uh, uh, I'll be getting you information out well before the meeting. If you have questions about it please call me or contact me before the meeting. It's something that, you know, is pretty time sensitive. Uh, we'll, when we, when you do the refunding uh, note, uh, you'll approve it on, on Monday the 7th and the bank is gonna have to be able to, uh, you know, do kind of push the buttons and do the, the necessary closing, uh, if not the next day, certainly within the, a few days of that meeting. So if you have any questions about what I send you before that meeting, please call me and get them answered before the meeting because it's kind of time sensitive. Thanks, Bill. Um, any questions or comments before we adjourn? No, just thanks, Bill, for all you do. Well, thank you. You too. All right. One, let's... one quick question. One quick comment. Yep. Uh, on the twenty-first, I won't be able to make the select board meeting. I'm. I work a 
uh, LCI way station. So uh, the Derby stole, you know, we don't, we won't get back in time for the, for the meeting. So that's the training night, Mike. I know. I feel I feel bad about that. Well, I'm kind of committed as a I'm a, I'm on a contract with them. You know, I I wasn't expecting that to be the 21st. What time is it going to be? I might be able to do something via via the Zoom. Um, well, the meeting's at seven o'clock, so it'll be shortly after. Right. Yeah, if we can set it up uh, to allow you to zoom in, we'll try to do that. I'll see if I could do it via Zoom. It'd be helpful if you could be there. Okay. Thanks for letting us know, Mike. All right. Uh, any other comments before we adjourn? Looks like we're one minute before nine. I will take a motion. Motion um, to adjourn. <laughs> Is there a second? Yeah. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Have a great night, everybody.